In 2005, Radek Saleh started working at a small business called Swiss Multivitamins. In 2015, as part owner, he sold it for a lazy, you ready, $1.7 billion. Yeah, with a B. Oh, and just nine months prior, he'd knocked back an offer of $30 million with an M. <laughs> Want to know how he did it? Me too. Hey, before the craziness begins on episode 371 of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, the marketing gold that's about to rain down on us all is made possible thanks to Cornerstone and 52ways.biz. Now, 52ways.biz is a free one-day live event that's filling up fast, hosted by small business expert Dale Beaumont, and it's for business owners who want to grow, so basically everyone. You can grab your free tickets over at 52ways.biz. B-I-Z, and there's some new dates announced for repeat performances in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane in late August. We're also made possible thanks to Cornerstone, which is an Aussie-owned, family-run, outsourcing business based in the Philippines, which I love so much, I own a part of. Yeah. If you need to get more stuff done, if you want a virtual assistant, if you want to become more profitable, I would give Cornerstone a call on 029037 8275. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show. A successful small business owners share their souls. To take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. I am your host, Timbo Reed. You, infinitely, infinitely, infinitely more importantly, are a motivated business owner. You're ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Oh boy, am I going to help you do that today along with a very special guest. We are joined by the brains behind the Swiss multivitamins brand, Radek Sali, who shares the tricks behind celebrity endorsement and the importance of building a rock-solid culture, which basically led to him selling the business last year for $1.7 billion. Unbelievable. We've got resident expert Dale Beaumont from 52 Ways, who brings back the GIF. Bring out the GIMP. <laughs> the GIMP sleep. Not the GIMP, bringing back the GIF. <laughs> Love that film. I share another low-cost marketing idea that will increase your average dollar amount per sale. And we go back into the small business big marketing vault, revisiting a past interview with the creator of the world's most viral marketing video. As per usual, team, there is marketing... What? What is it? G-O-L-D, dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. I had to laugh. You know how a couple of weeks ago, a couple of episodes ago, I had a whinge about not enough people leaving comments in the show notes? (laughs) The first one I get is a whinge. Love a whinge. I can't remember the fellow's name. I asked for comments. I certainly got one. It was that. It was for the Cater Boot episode. You know the the girl Kara uh, uh, who is making these fantastic Western boots. Someone said you can't be serious when you're agreed with your guest about the cost of an adult's boot starting at three hundred and forty nine dollars being reasonable. Get serious, Timbo. <laughs> Gotta love it. And then I said, well, I was serious. They're very good quality boots, and I ran ran it on about having a millionaire's mindset and blah blah. He comes back and he goes, I don't agree with exploiting animals for our selfish needs when it's proven that you can thrive on a plant-based diet and produce footwear using ethical materials. Well, hey, that's cool. That's cool. (laughs) I was looking for some more marketing kind of discussion and feedback. Anyway, there were some people who have left comments in the show notes, and for that, I thank you. I've responded to them all. All right. What's this button do? Life just got a whole lot easier. 
Hi, it's Dale Beaumont here from 52ways.biz, the best one-day business workshop ever with another productivity tool to make your business life a whole lot easier. So what is the tool that I have for you today? Well, it's called Giphy Capture, and you can check it out by Googling Giphy Capture. That'll take you to the website, and there you can download some software on your Mac or your PC. Now, this software is used to create a GIF. Now, hopefully you know what a GIF is, but if not, I'll quickly explain. It's basically a cross between a still image and a video. Think of it like a moving image. You may have seen them before being shared on social media, and now even Facebook allows you to share GIFs in the comments as well. But now you can use this tool to create your own GIFs, and these are very effective if you want to use them in your email broadcasts, or you may want to put them on your website as well to get more people clicking on your call to actions. So all you need to do is download this software and then you can take a video that you may have put onto YouTube. Then you can place this box over the top of the actual video, play it for about five seconds and record it, and then it will take that particular video and turn it into a GIF image. If you want to find out more about this, you can come along to one of my free events where I give you a live demo. But right now, check out Giphy Capture. It's a really cool tool. There you go. I told you life would get a whole lot easier. This has been Dale Beaumont from 52ways.biz. Now, back to you, Timbo. <sighs> life just got a whole lot easier. Oh, I love it, Dale. Giphy Capture, great tool. Uh, I've seen Dale use it very effectively. Hey, if you're loving the productivity tools Dale is sharing, then you are going to love 52ways.biz, which is his live events, eight hours of business building gold. And you can grab your tickets over at 52ways.biz. And uh, they're free. Go with a mate. I did. And uh, there are some new dates launched for Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. Repeat performances. Got to love that. Coming up after today's interview, I'll share another low-cost marketing idea in that segment we've all grown to love called What Have You Got to Lose? But right now, the interview you're about to hear, I'm putting it in my top three. Yeah, I am. I know. Right there. I've said it. It's with 40-year-old retired CEO Radak Salee of Swiss Multivitamins, which is a wellness business that sells supplements, skincare, and superfoods. In case you don't know that and you're in Australia, you've probably been living under a rock because Swiss is absolutely everywhere. I sat next to Radek recently at a Hawthorne football club function. Go Hawks! And I was pretty damn excited as the Swiss brand is one that I've admired from a distance for many, many years. I might have kind of fanboyed him a bit. I don't know. Don't know! Uh, You know, from its high-quality packaging to its brand consistency to its relentless celebrity endorsement efforts and high-frequency TV and print advertising schedule by celebrity endorsements. We're talking like Nicole Kidman and, and, you know, the the who's who of every industry and sport, basically. Um, Swiss would have to be one of the most well-known and respected brands in Australia. Now, Radix started uh, at Swiss in 2005 with no equity as the operations manager. He left there last year as part owner, he'll tell you how much equity he had, having sold the business for a lazy $1.7 billion. Brilliant. Hey, how's that for a small business success story? He attributes celebrity endorsement strategy and an honest and meaningful business culture to the brand's success. He's won, and his team have won some incredible awards, Uh, BRW's Most most Successful Business of the Year, 2012 GQ Businessman of the Year, and in 2016, Ernest & Young's Young Entrepreneur of the Year for his industry. You're going to love this interview. Seriously, he he's so humble, he's so transparent and so honest in what he shares. I started off by asking Radek what it was like to sell a business he'd part-owned and was instrumental in building for a lazy $1.7 billion. So, Radek, welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Thanks for having me. Finally. Finally, awesome to be uh, here, finally. After hey. meeting at a Hawks event uh, a few weeks ago. Exactly. We got you here. Now, mate, I want to start at the end and, mm-hmm. and ask you, how did it feel to sell a small business that you were responsible for building for $1.7 billion? It's still sort of sinking in. Uh, it, it felt, to be honest, like I'd been driving a Formula One car really, really fast 
and then suddenly the car disintegrated around me. <laughs> and, and the shock of that uh, was was pretty pretty full on at first. And um, but now you sort of you look back and you you you, you really feel like that some pretty unique things happened and um and also unique things start to, to open up and um, so, so let me understand so does, in does, terms of yeah so it's pretty surreal <laughs> does it, it's clearly still raw yeah look, it's, it's a year ago yeah look it's well it closed out in december so uh, of last year so the deal closed like that's yeah, like so, that was the there was a date in december where it's like we're done that's right so that's when it started to feel really real because uh, September 15 is when we actually got the first part of the right. transaction done. 2016. Yeah. I don't know. 2015. F- 2015. So, so just tell me about so, disintegration because that's a, that seems like a <laughs> negative word to me. No. So, so just you're driving this Formula One car, which is the Swiss multivitamin brand. Yes. It's rocking. It's flying. Yeah. You do this. You do that. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then what's the disintegration? Well, I think that it, it comes from – I should – Give you context around that. Yes, uh, the, the, the Ferrari is a, is a, is one of the, the best F one teams, and I'm a big fan of Ferrari. You got one? Uh, that that's a good story that goes with that. So I can tell you. Let me just make that note. Yeah, come back yeah. to that one. Um, so so the F- Ferrari technical director um, talks about building the perfect F one car, and the perfect F one car goes so fast. And it goes so brilliantly that um, it, it sets lap records and it runs um, faster around any corner than any other cars running and so forth and it pushes it right to the edge. Um, but it on the finish line, because it's gone so fast and you've driven it to the edge, it disintegrates. Oh, uh, so, wow. And that's that's so his, this is a good his, thing. His, yeah, this is a good thing. This is this is the aim of the, you know of a, a technical director of an F one uh, racing <laughs> team is to to have a car that disintegrates on the line. So I truly felt like that our car got to that line and it disintegrated, um, but it was the perfect race. Nothing left. And we, we you got nothing. You've only, given it everything. We're only racing that race, hey? So brilliant. <laughs> so, um, so hence that the disintegration. Must be, but okay, so huge positive disintegration. <laughs> yes. must be hugely emotional. Can you? It was is. there a moment upon when that date passed where we're not going back here? We've just sold for one point seven billion. You've got some skin in that game. Mm. Can you tell us how much? Just out of Interest? Yeah, I had fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. Just do the yeah. numbers on that quickly, Steve. Um, <laughs> and, and and was there a moment where you have uh, collapsed, cried, uh, got hugely emotional? Well, there was a moment in September fifteen where I thought I was going to get out at that time, and then um, thirty minutes before we were going to do the deal, I was told the great news that if I was to leave, I'd be sued for a hundred million dollars. Uh, sooner than December right. of last year. <laughs> so here I was thinking that I was going to jump out of the F1 car and, and needed to sort of do some work on myself and, um, and, and, and think about how that was going to be a, a condition that was sustainable for me and, and what conditions I'd put back to, to ensure that I could get through that. Extra did, uh, 14 parts. Uh, did you get the speed wobbles? Let's keep using we, the racing. We did. Exactly. You, you did. Did you just like, we did, this, so, this is just going, yeah, so I, I was, can't cope? Yeah, well, no, a little bit. Um, I, but um, but um, I, I, I sort of intuitively knew that that day wasn't going to be the day. I knew that we were going to leave um, a certain amount of shares in the business and, um, and management were, were leaving more shares than others. And so we, we were... Um, we set ourselves for another run and um, we successfully got on that last tra- tranche of shares 20% more than the initial tranche of shares. So, so it worked so, out really well. Okay. So was that getting out, just so I understand that, mm. it, the speed wobbles was more about I think we've got enough more than like you're in above your head, you don't know what you're doing anymore. It wasn't that. No, it wasn't anything like that. Right. It was just... You're a tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that... Um, I think that... You, if you're in your business, you know uh, what you, you're capable of doing. And I think that the, any, any, when, you, when you're selling your business, the, the best time to sell a business is when you've got momentum on your side and you've, the business has still got plenty more to give rather than there's nothing left in the tank and what are you buying? the business is going to be found out really quickly by the new owners and so forth. So I was really confident in the fact that we still had a big story to tell and, in fact, our profits doubled in the year after 
the business was sold in um, September 15. Because didn't you get – what was the offer in the year prior to selling for $1.7 billion? Yeah, so uh, nine months prior to that we were offered uh, $30 million for <laughs> – the whole business. I had, I had $15 million worth of debt against my 15%. Wow. Uh, so that would have left me in a lot of debt. How can you, what did? What was the one thing you did? Where's the silver bullet that you've gone from a valuation of $30 million to $1.7 billion in nine months? No, well, there was no one silver bullet. Two? It was a, <laughs> no, there was, it was a build-up of, of a number of things that we could see in the business and the banks could see in the business as well. And that's why they kept refinancing us and believing in us. Um, it was just a case of, okay, well, do we want to do risk now? And this is what the business is worth now. And this is what a, 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 a group's prepared to pay. And and we were seriously considering it. So, But what did you do? What was the... What was the okay, there's not one thing you did, but how can you... I just don't understand how you can go from $30 million to $1.7 billion. That's right. So um, what we did was there was a... So four years, let's roll back four years from September 15, uh, we started the Project Gold, for, well, probably five years, and and Project Gold became what was what's codenamed for China Operation Growing Sales in China. And uh, I went over to China and the US um, to, to look at opportunities in both of those countries. And I'd been travelling the world a lot with our executive team and, and just working out what would be our next move if we were to move internationally. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we went to China with um, someone that we would hire, a, basically a guy that was focused on international business, and he had relationships um, in China where he had sold uh, raw materials to them or uh, partnered with various organisations there for manufacturing. And relationships are all powerful in China. So we reconnected with those relationships and they were all really keen to do something, um, but just for them, timing was wrong. At the same time we went to the US, where relationships are a one-hour meeting and yeah, right. everything's really positive, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but um, it's just a different ball game in the way they think. Um, so, so the US seemed to be um, a little easier from a Westerner's point of view, the rule of law, um, language and um, the opportunity in terms of creating a premium brand and, and pharmacies and, and, and uh, supermarkets and so forth are, are like what we see here. So, so um, and, and also the personalities that you use to, to drive your brands, um, such as we're using Nicole Kidman and, and TV shows like X Factor and um, it's all similar. Yeah, all, all very similar. Um, so you're speaking the same language and we just went and met retailers there rather than investors. Right. And the retailers got our message straight away and, and we sort of had a, a, a few meetings with the likes of Walgreens who, you know, have 8,000 stores across the country. Um, you, you suddenly go, um, you, know, you suddenly talk to them about what we're doing and they go, they get really excited and you go, well, hang on, we're on to something yeah. here. Um, and and they kind of they they got so excited that when we got back we thought we were, we were going to start thinking about the US and um, and they kept pushing us to to get stock over to them and we actually weren't ready to, to right. provide them stock but um it's something but, you but know, to sum that up it was the relations the partnerships that you built in China that yes. took a little bit longer that ended up paying the big dividend right? that's right so, so that put- China investment in time but the <clears throat> the US launch got us connected with um, Nicole Kidman and Ellen, right. Ellen DeGeneres okay and it's well, all let- about hedging our bet let's jump into that <laughs> you know there's so much I want to cover yeah. and celebrity endorsement is one of them they're like trying to timeline this thing we will we'd be here for like <laughs> years right so there are a number of factors that achieved the amazing success that you and your team at Swiss did. Mm. Celebrity endorsement as a marketing strategy was one of them, right? Mm. How did that come about? It's not a cheap way to go. It was, <laughs> it was, it was basically in the first six months of my role, uh, I, I spent uh, most of my time going around visiting all of our retailers and, and listening to, to, um, to them and basically understanding how the market worked. I spent time with our um our salespeople and and um, and just visiting health food stores as well, and I'd walk into pharmacies and there would be walls of Centrum, and and Centrum, Centrum multivitamins. That's right, the number one seller at the time of multivitamins, and I'd, I'd walk, I'd ask the pharmacist, I go, well, why why do you give this brand so much space? And 
And is it margin? And I'd say no, it's actually the worst margin in the category. <laughs> is, is it because the product works better than anyone else? No, no, you're, you, you guys are the one. If I, if I sell your multivitamin, I've always got a regular customer. Um, so, I go, well, so what is wow. it? They, 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 they said, oh, well, they, they, gave, they give me this great point of sale and there was a picture of Rob DeCostella, who was a, um, a um, marathon runner from the Commonwealth Games. He, he, won he wasn't a, even an Olympian, was he? In the 80s. I think he made oh, the Olympics, he, he actually, but he, he yeah. didn't, he didn't, um, you know, he didn't um, come in sort of a top 10 or 20 right. placing. Um, but he, he did win a gold at the Commonwealth Games in the 80s. Um, and, and, you know, oh, I'd, wow. I'd moved across the Swiss in the mid 2000s. Yeah. So, so um, there's Deeks, and um, he was also on TV 52 weeks of the year uh, with Centrum. So th- that to me got the mind thinking of how do we do something that's similar but a little bit better. And um, and so um, we knew that we supplied uh, product to Cricket Australia, and um, so we knew that Ricky Ponting would be on our multivitamin. So we called Ricky Ponting and his management. And we said, would you like to, to endorse our brand? What do you think of it? And he said, yeah, I'll take the product. It's fantastic. And um, we got Ricky Ponting on board. Uh, and then we came up with the way of, well, okay, well, great, we've got Ricky now. How are we going to actually tell people about that <laughs> and do it in a way that's cost effective? Because we had nowhere near the funds to put us on 52 weeks a year TV. Uh, we just decided to advertise only in the cricket uh-huh. And we shot two terrible ads. If you look at them now, you, they're, they're laughable. <laughs> in what way? Uh, well, we had one of Ricky doing the housework around the house at a fast Ooh, pace. and nasty. Sort of fast forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Made it, and, and that was all because of the multivitamin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and another one of him sitting in a hotel room talking about what he takes on a, a trip overseas and, um, you know, his, right. his bat, his helmet and, and a Swiss multivitamin. Nice. And, um, no cliches there. I, exactly. It was full of cliches. <laughs> and I knew we'd made it when I was driving into work and, and it was Husey on, on the morning show and they were, they were getting people to call in on what was the most annoying advert. And guess what? Yeah, Ricky Potty. We won. <laughs> yeah, Love it. Yeah, so we're talking about you. So we got cut through. So um, is it, okay, That's a good thing, right? You want cut through. Sure. And uh, particularly when you're small and you're trying to But even to if they're big. talking negatively about you, I have a lot of business owners listening who get scared. Bit of fun. A, bit of fun. Smile and it's okay. You want to be talked about. Yep. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with being a bit edgy occasionally. So, so just um, the learnings there before you keep expanding on the endorsement strategy mm. is that you've identified uh, Centrum are winning with Deeks. You've identified Ricky Ponting as a leading Australian figure who's taking your product, reach out to him, he's happy to endorse. Um, But the clever part is you create average ads with him but place them in the program, the cricket, in which he's appearing. That's right. Do those ads appear anywhere else with no. Ricky? And, and that nine that, that say magic? to me, we're going to give you some bonus ads outside of the cricket, I'd say don't worry about it. Put it all in the cricket. Wow. And if you're going to give me any bonus ads, put them in the sports section around the um, the news. But I wanted to make sure that whoever was watching that ad would have a high probability of liking Ricky and wanting to stop and listen to, to what he had to say. So that was really, really important. Then the other part of that is too when you're explaining it to a retailer, Okay, we're doing this great TV campaign. You, you simplify it. You say we're doing this great TV campaign with Ricky Ponting in the cricket. People get the fact that if you're in the cricket, they'll listen to Ricky and you're going to get a better cut through rather mm-hmm. than a, oh, we're targeting 25s to, to, to 40-year-olds and um, this, this males is genius. and we're going to pick TV programs that are like that and so forth. Uh, marketers get that, but uh, someone that hasn't done a marketing degree doesn't. Well, there's that element of wastage. I mean, I, it breaks my heart when I hear it, when a small business owner advertising in, say, a major newspaper and there's just so much wastage, whereas what you've got is people who love cricket, they love Ricky, you're only advertising Ricky. This is, I, I get it. I get yeah. it. So, okay, that's worked. Yeah. Retailers are starting to buy in. I guess you've got point of sale with Ricky on it. That's right. Yeah, holding yep. the suitcase and Absolutely, the broom. Yeah. And the, no. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Yeah. What next? So what next? Uh, what next was that I had a meeting with Priceline, and I was telling the buyer there about uh, how well Ricky was going, and and she said to me, "Who's Ricky?" <laughs> <laughs> um, Not a cricket fan. We, yeah, well, she, and and that's the, the you know a, a lot of females in this this country. So and ninety five percent of the Priceline consumer are female, mind you. Um, uh, she got hassled by her her, her male. Um, 
uh, executives a few months later and saying, well, why aren't we doing a promotion with Swiss um, and Ricky Ponting? <laughs> um, it gave us an opportunity to go back to them with a more female-friendly sport audience uh-huh. through the tennis, uh, which has a much bigger female audience, um, and that did very, very well for them. Um, but it opened the conversation up to talk. Um, but, yeah, so when she said to me that um, she, um, she didn't know who Ricky was, uh, we've got to go and get a female ambassador. So um, sitting at home one night for dinner, um, Dancing with the Stars was on at, at mum, mum and Dad's house. Yeah, yeah not, at, not at your house. <laughs> no, yeah, old home home. Yeah, yeah. So I was sitting there and um, and mum, mum doesn't watch much TV um, and, and Dancing with the Stars was perennial. And, and there was Sonia Kruger, um, you know, a bit edgy and, and good fun. And probably top of her game back then. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so I I just thought you know she'd make a great ambassador. It was the number one rating TV program on on on, on TV at the time. So we called her her management and and got through to her too, and asked her whether she took Swiss. And funnily enough, she did. And it goes back. Do you to, reckon she really did? No, she did. So this goes back to this. Remember, I was saying to the pharmacist, you know, which product you know, is is it because people come back for Centrum every time they after they take it. And I said, no, no, that's your one. That if we recommend your product, people keep coming back for it. We actually have the highest retention out of any brand in the category um, because that was always our position as premium. So, yep. And that's why we could advertise like we did because if you've got a great product, what can you do? You market it. Market it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, well, I was gonna, the, the, it's a simple part and as is was a great product. It the best a, marketing is a great product. That's right. So, well, this, they, they sort of work hand in hand. Yes. You can't be a fraudster in that space, yeah? So, uh, and particularly go it as, as aggressively as we did. Yep. So, we we, um, we had Sonia Kruger taking the product and she was really happy to do a deal in the space, but Channel 7 weren't happy because we were this group that only spent a million dollars in the last 12 months on TV. Right. And all of a sudden, we'd signed up the rights to their biggest... Uh, star at the time. I don't understand um, why they're not happy because they don't own Sonia. Yeah, she's an employee. Oh, she's a, she's contracted to seven. That's right. Ah. So, and and there's only a limited amount. Yeah, yeah. A personality can do on TV in yep. terms of endorsements. Otherwise, it becomes just okay too much. So they were like, "Oh, hang on, we were like the insurance company, yep. car." Um, so they, they they rolled us in and said, well, "What are you guys up to? How's this going to work?" and so forth and. And we managed to convince them that we're going to grow the category and that it would be a really good idea to try advertising with Sonia in Dancing with the Stars, like we've done with Ricky in, in the cricket. And funnily enough, this had never happened. So it happened in sports shows but mm. never in a lifestyle show. Mm-hmm. And so it was pretty groundbreaking. We had to get a permission from the BBC because the BBC <laughs> owned Dancing with the Stars. stars yeah. um, and we got that. And, and we ran our advertising in Dancing with the Stars. And, and just like the Ricky model, we all of a sudden got this amazing cut through because, again, people watching Dancing yes. with the Stars love Sonia and those that didn't like Sonia didn't know were linked to Sonia. Um, and all of a sudden we're getting this great niche core audience, which is mass. So um, you're but trading off angle. two properties in the cricket and Dancing with the Stars that you really right. you, you have no invested interest in except that you're running ads. Correct. Quite. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. No one done it before? No one had done it before back then, yeah. Right. So now it happens all the time. Okay. Um, and, and then the other the other trick component was that we, we create, rather than doing like a um, promotion right across the country um, with every retailer, what we did is, because we, we tried these promotions and you'd get limited support from the retailers that if the promotion was available at every retailer, um, such as... Um, uh, win a trip to New York or um, or Argentina to learn the salsa. Or, or, mm-hmm. We had like a, a, a dance themed um, competition, or or go to go and watch the cricket and um, go to the Ashes. Um, when we did that across all of our retailers, it got limited support because it wasn't exclusive to the group that was yeah right in hand. So what we did is we actually made it exclusive to. Chemist Warehouse, or then we'll ne- make the next one exclusive to Priceline. Yep. And what would happen is we got much better support from that retail group as a result of that. And um, also it made it competitive because then all of a sudden you'd get Woolworths wanting a promotion that they'd seen at Chemist Warehouse, or they would see um, uh, Chemist, uh, Chemist Warehouse would be you know, uh, upset that they didn't get 
so picks this one and, and you take that that um, them going oh well you know why didn't you give uh, offer it to us you, you you'd always go in there with a solution of well what about we do something else and and that then enabled us to do other programs and then also ensure the the advertising we're doing so we'd sell them in enough stock we'd say okay if you want this promotion you need to buy and if the promotion was costing us a million bucks you need to buy a million bucks worth of stock yeah, so okay. it would always break even no matter break what. even you just to finish up on that endorsement discussion like Nicole Kidman I'm just trying to think who's the top of the Swiss tree Nicole Kidman in terms of she was the most expensive, yeah. Was she? How much? <laughs> um, I can't say exact. So. Ish. Ish. <laughs> um, in the millions of dollars wow. per year, yeah. Per year. Yeah. And, like, top three. Top, top three. Top three in expense and then top three effectiveness. Okay. So I, I can't ever point to anyone being more effective than the other. Really? Um, yeah, because it's all, the, the thing around any sort of this, any sort of activity, it's not like a one-off event where you see an advert and you race straight out to buy a product. Mm -hmm. And and when you're doing, you you go from Ricky to Dancing with the Stars, Uh, then we went on to AFL, then we went on to the Olympics, then we did an Ellen DeGeneres campaign. You did Ellen DeGeneres? Yeah, we brought her out to Australia um, when we launched in the US and brought the whole show here. And um, that was a way to offset and hedge our risk in um, the US. Right. And... um, it worked for us, the selling, in creating momentum in the US, um, but, but the retailers just didn't deliver their So it's part. interesting because, again, I mean, we're talking to small business owners here. They love, you know, they want to do a mark, take a marketing action and they want to see a sales result, which yes. is understandable because yes. budgets are limited, pockets are Correct. shallow. You, on the other hand, is it is it that you can, you know, in the, in the corporate marketing world, mm. afford to just do brand awareness? No. We, we had a sales and marketing director and would always connect the sale to marketing. So as I was saying before, we offset any of these promotions with a retailer agreeing right. to buy enough stock to underpin. So we became a huge corporate thinking like a small business in connecting the sale to the marketing. Always connecting the sale to the marketing. So that's why we brought Ellen to though. Australia because it, it made us actually the number one brand in Australia as well as launched us in the US. Yep. And as a result of becoming the number one brand in Australia, we awoke in this big Chinese market locally here in Australia where there's a million uh, local uh, na- Chinese nationals, there's yep. a million tourists that travel through Australia and there's a half a million Chinese students. They love this this category. I um, mm. t- I, I spoke uh, recently at a USANA conference, which yes. is a direct marketing company yeah, selling yeah, no, a USANA lot. Of, well. Okay, good multivitamin. Uh, good what? Good multivitamin. I, I guess it you is. Just have I, to I don't take know. Six or nine of them a day. That's <laughs> it's a major lot of problem. Yeah. Um, but ninety percent of the audience were um, uh, Asian, and I spoke in New Zealand and Australia. Mm. I've just been up to Cairns recently, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, weird Timbo, I guess. Um, I was standing in the coals um, buying. a couple of things. I had the man flu yeah. and I was standing in that aisle and I was just watching some Asian people. There's a lot yeah. of Japanese up there. Yeah. They're just interrogating the vitamins and yeah. all that stuff. They That's love right. it. No wonder you got 1.7 billion selling to a Chinese company. <laughs> hey, it was well, a- that, that same Chinese company was one of the companies we met in China uh, five years before we, right. we did the sale. Who uh, said the timing wasn't right for them. Partnerships, so, long-term exactly. Relationship and, and we yeah. kept connecting back with them. Um, and and eventually got a deal done with them. Just to finish, uh, you can't say who the top three most effective celebrities were. Mm -hmm. Uh, They all had a similar impact. What about the top three most expensive? Ellen, uh, Nicole. (laughs) Ellen Ellen was the most expensive, um, but but that's because we did. You brought the whole We owned the whole show and we um, we did a whole lot of activity over an intensive period of time. Um, Nicole um, was the most expensive, not for the... Uh, for the whole period of time that we work with her, and she's still an ambassador. So, um, but again, probably most effective on a global scale. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you you go to Asia, she's an yep. a- ambassador for Amiga, wow. uh, Chanel, and and there are there are billboards of her everywhere. So she yep. just speaks to that audience yep. really really well. Um, and then you'd have the Olympics and, and the Olympic rings, and and that was a fantastic partnership for us. And we were the first. Uh, vitamin brand to, to sponsor the Olympics and, you know. You, you know, 
Radek, and, and by the way, listeners, I am speaking to Radek Salih, who is the retired, at the ripe old age of what? 40. <laughs> retired CEO of the Swiss Group. Um, I, I haven't forgotten the Ferrari question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will come back to that at the end. Um, I, I'm going to be really naive here, and I've said on my show before, you know, I'd be driving around with my son who was doing business management at school in year 12 a couple of years ago, and he'd go, Dad, how does that cafe make money? I'm like, Jack... I don't know, mate. Got to sell a lot of coffee and they're happy to take minimum wage. I just don't get it, right? There's a lot of businesses I look at like that. Swiss is no different because all I see over the last few years as a consumer and as a marketing guy who's looked upon what you've been doing in awe, I just go, there's hundreds of millions of dollars. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but there's hundreds of millions of dollars going out. Olympic endorsement, Ellen DeGeneres, Nicole Kidman, like... You, you, you got to sell so many little vitamin tablets to get that money back, and then make a lot. What, what am What am I missing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that we always knew that uh, we could switch off the advertising. So it's not like a, a um, building a factory and, and the plant equipment and the ongoing costs that go with that. Um, your marketing costs, you, you, they're an investment in brand, and and they do make an impact, as we all well know. Uh, but the and the bank doesn't treat it the same way, uh, you know. Your, your capital investments treated so. Uh, but the the benefit is that if things go bad, you still got this great momentum of brand advertising that you've done, um, sales creation, and people creating this sort of loyal connection with your brand that keep coming back as a result of trying your brand through the, the advertising they've potentially seen. I remember we had this highest retention, so when they're trying it, we'll keep the most amount of customers. So um, our big thing was about getting people to try our product. Right. And uh, all our research pointed to when people the, tried our product, they would stick with it. Clearly the lifetime value of a customer is huge. It's fantastic. And I'm guessing the margins, like I look at, I stand at the counter at Chemist Warehouse. I have a bit of a Chemist Warehouse fetish. I interviewed uh, yeah. Jack Gantz, the owner, only Seen a few Damien weeks after ago. This. <laughs> What's that? It's Damien, I, Damien Gantz and, yeah. and I are still great friends. Great. So um, seeing him after this. No. So, like, I have a bit of a Chemist Warehouse fetish. They're amazing. I'm standing there looking at Swiss vitamins and I'm going, it's 60 bucks. Uh, it's expensive. I've got to buy the four to kind of make it all the potion. And the margins must be huge, surely. Uh, the margins weren't initially. Uh, but we broke down a very lazy supply chain and, and that was a huge part of our success was uh, breaking that down and um, getting rid of middle people, uh, simplifying the amount of times the product needed to be tested uh, rather than buying it through an agent, through an agent, an agent and getting tested each time, going straight to farms and uh, working Did you own a lot more of the supply chain or you just got rid of components of it that were... We just worked directly with um, those that were core to it. And also went and worked with the most efficient manufacturers globally. So, um, and that forced manufacturers here in Australia to become more efficient and effective in the way they went about stuff. And volume was another big thing. So we replaced discounts for product. And um, as a result of that, we're creating more product. What do you mean you replaced discounts for product? You know how you give a trade discount when you sell something? Um, Instead of giving that trade discount, off invoice would say we'll give you product. Aha, uh-huh. give you more product. Yes, which is more valuable to the retailer. <clears throat> of course. Can be dangerous because you can over stuff your supply yep. chain with stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Why aren't you buying from us? Oh, yeah. You gave us so much last yeah. time. <laughs> so when you're doing it, you really need to make sure you've got a, a really strong point of sale campaign that sells product through at the right price and you're really focusing on managing your stock right throughout. Because we did get caught out a few times with too much stock in the market. Okay. Um, but we, got, we got really, really good at that. And as a result of that, you know, we were manufacturing volumes far greater than anyone else in the world. Um, so our product quality was better than it had ever been, um, but the the efficiencies were, were you know, we, we, we were making product at um, 30% um, less cost than what we were um, five, ten years prior Interesting. to that. Interesting. Uh, um, similar story, uh, Declan Lee, who is the founder of Gelato Messino, which oh, is one yeah. of the great gelato brands, right? And, um, you know, he, he was in this chair recently and talking about they've gone and bought the, the, the hazelnut farm because right. they just want to do – they, they, it's, it's the cheapest – route to market and it's going to be better hazelnuts. They've bought Jersey cows and land down in Dalesford. They're going to do the milk for the – and it's like, yeah. 
cutting costs and in getting a bit of product as that's a result, right. right? That's right. It's um, amazing what happens when you dig into the supply chain. Oh, Radek, <laughs> mate, I, I love your story. Let's talk culture. Yeah. Let's talk culture because uh, in, t- in chatting to you the other day, there was celebrity endorsement that underpinned Swiss's, underpinned Swiss's success. The other thing was the culture that you'd created. Mm. Before you tell us about the culture, what kind of a CEO were you? Yeah. I would say um, that's a bit different. <laughs> um, I, was, I was a CEO that um, uh, likes to listen, loves to admit when I'm wrong, um, wear that as a bit of a badge of honour, um, but truly believe the sky's the beginning and um, always see greater opportunity as a result of um, having a go um, rather than not and, and looking for excuses for why we shouldn't do something. We want to work out how we can do it and how we can do it better than others. So, Really? Mm. That sounds amazing. Like, <laughs> almost like, did you, give me an example of where you walked that talk, where uh, you stood in front of your staff who yeah. clearly look up to you, this young gun CEO of Australia's biggest brand, and you've gone, guys, didn't quite get this right. Oh, there'd be countless examples that I'd go through. You almost enjoy it, did you? Um, but yeah, it was what, awesome. What can I admit today um, where I mucked up? So I'd, 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 count, I'd talk a lot about the US and how we went over there with not enough money and weren't prepared. And and we ended up with $70 million worth of debt and zero profit. And I needed to convince the banks that we had a, you know, a way of getting out of that situation. But also needed to convince our team that we were going to do the right things to pay down that debt and make sure that they had a, a great career. And, and so there's a lot of business, business owners listening. What's mm. the secret to convincing people to come along? Honesty, with... regular communication. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I, look, I think those two things are key and making sure you bring people along for that journey but also making sure that when green shoots start to, to show, you start to share the benefit of that and you give back a lot of the things perhaps you've had to turn down through more difficult times. Do uh, you, you mean like profit sharing and, and yeah, look at, sharing and the riches? Rewarding, exactly, profit sharing, creating a great culture, making sure that culture's still very good in difficult times but you can't do everything that you potentially do in great times to create I, I a great culture. I wonder how many um, CEOs and just bosses of businesses don't communicate and don't share. If my first 10 years of my career in advertising worked at Cleminger's and Peter Cleminger, we had this building which was four stories and it was mezzanine so you could stand on the fourth floor and look down to the second floor. Yeah. So Peter Cleminger, there'd be this announcement every couple of weeks and Peter, you know, everyone would be congregating on the second floor. Peter would be up on the fourth <laughs> floor. It's like, you know, like, I'm never coming down to your level. But <laughs> what he did do was share where we're at. We lost this pitch. We won this pitch. We got this award. We got this. And I remember as, as a young upstart account bloke, I was like, I really like this. Yeah. And I still look back on those times when there's this guy who I admired so much was sharing. Mm. He'd never admit mistakes, Peter Clemenger. Yeah. <laughs> if you're listening, Pete, love your work. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. you know, still he was sharing. I think it's great. Honesty yeah. and communication. Yeah. And we had a comms plan that went with that. So um, there were things like monthly newsletters that I'd have to write. And I didn't really enjoy writing those. <laughs> newsletters? Um, but, yeah. It's very old school. <laughs> exactly. But it was really, really important for... Um, the team, and it wouldn't be for everyone, you know. Otherwise, it might be the the the, the presentation I'll do once a week or once a month, depending on how the business was trading. Um, if it was trading really tough, we'd do them weekly, and I'd be standing up in front of everyone. You know, it, it, I, I go back to the analogy of you know, I don't know if there are many of your listeners here have husbands, wives, boyfriend, girlfriend. Probably. Yeah, and, and I bet all of them, or even children uh, or parents, all of them at one time or another have been told that you don't listen to me. Uh, <laughs> and these are the people that we love most in mm-hmm. our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so I take that analogy to the workplace. Now, who's going to be listening to sure. someone they're not in love with, hey? They <laughs> aren't family. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you really need to put a big effort into comms and you do need to make sure that you do it in all various formats. So uh, for some it may work that sort of presentation like you talked about. Mm-hmm. Others it might be that they need to read something and, and digest sure. it. So, so we really thought about that at Swiss and um, that helped us a lot. You as a CEO... Running this brand have had huge successes. You're an honest fella, Radic. Was there a moment when you can remember that ego 
got in the way of you being the best person you can be? I th- <laughs> Funny, I, I think um, definitely we've all got a, a shine to um, ego um, occasionally getting the better of us. Um, it's just being aware of that and being conscious of it. And I think that if you do work on yourself, like things like meditation where you, you, you've got a greater awareness of why you're doing things and the present moment, you start to get a sense of that, that ego is probably not the, the best of friends. It can, it can be a great thing to drive motive and set goals, yep. but it, it shouldn't be the decision maker in, in, the, in, in, in a moment. Yeah. Mm. You've got three pillars, premium, proven, aspirational, that you talk about being almost filters that transcend, transcend every aspect of the Swiss brand's success. Can you just tell us about those? So it was about setting up a brand architecture that enabled people to make decisions while the key people weren't in the room. And whenever we were doing something, we needed to consider those three pillars as a way of creating an advert or creating a product or even doing an activity that, um, res- that, that sort of reinforced what our culture was about. It would always be um, considerate of premium, proven and aspirational. <laughs> and, um, and, and that, um, that anchor would, would in, it would enable for the right decisions to be consistently made. Mm. And, and also what we'd do is we'd talk about examples of what, those, what, what it was to be premium or what it was to be aspirational. So and, and that would work for office proven. fit out to celebrity choice to hiring new team members, yeah, th- right throughout. So I would always think about those those uh, key buckets in in ensuring that we we, we stayed on on brand. How do you get and everything we did would reinforce what our brand. How many staff? Uh, we we got up to th- uh, four hundred in the end. How do you yeah. get four hundred to kind of buy into something like that? Oh, you got to go back to simplifying it even a step further where we had our culture, which was people, principles and passion coming before profit and we had this culture plan that sat next to our business plan. And um, and so what we'd do is we'd say, okay, what does uh, a people action mean to you? And, and we'd run workshops with the various areas of the business. And, of course, a people action would be very different from an executive team's point of view to, say, our warehouse and logistics team's right. point of view, what it meant to reinforce our people values. Okay. So we'd run these workshops regularly across our business in aligning people and getting people uh, understanding what our values were about and then we'd bring them through the whole journey and through to our business plan and, and, and then we would have uh, example behaviours of how we could be successful that we would all uh, have buy-in on. Um, and and then also reward people for acting uh, the way we were talking about hmm. was the right way um, to act for success. Mate, uh, it's a great story, Radic. Uh, do you drive a Ferrari? Occasionally. <laughs> so, so my father bought a Ferrari in celebration uh, of me coming oh. about uh, 40 years ago, uh, and uh, he paid, I think it was $14,000 for his four-seater Ferrari um, and he picked it up in Italy. Um, he was uh, he, he's a surgeon, and he was studying in, um, in in Scotland. And so he bought a Ferrari. And uh, I always grew up uh, with that that Ferrari being a highly aspirational thing in our garage that he would only very rarely drive because it was cost so much to service and so <laughs> forth. Um, so it was a real special event to go out in the Ferrari. Anyway, so that was always something that I, I would I wanted to do when. I was able to afford it, so that was the thing I treated myself to. Um, Good on you, mate. The deal I would have gone a four seater Ferrari. So. A, a four seater? <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't well, know they existed. They do, yeah, yeah. So, they, and Dad had a four seater as well. So what? Yeah, yeah. So I've even been to the Ferrari factory the, in Moderna. And there you go. Uh, it's FF Ferrari. So it's the um, it's it's a four, it's as close as the closer thing that they would build a, a, a to to a four wheel drive that they they will build. It's a, it's all wheel drive. And uh, you could put your mountain bike in the back. All right, mate. I think your ego's, <laughs> ego's getting a bit, a bit ahead of you right now. Um, I would have gone the Lambo personally. The but, Lambo? Uh, yeah, they, that's an experience turning on one of those engines. Oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> I've, I've never done it. But every time I see one, Just I'm like... Just less practical, uh, though. You, less like, practical, yeah, isn't it? It's got the four-wheel drive version. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, before I let you go, 15% of a lot of money is a lot of money. Mm. Uh it feels like there's a lot left in you. Um, mm. I'm guessing you're kind of rewarding yourself with 
cars and holidays and yep. downtime with growing the family, your hair. growing your hair. Yeah, <laughs> you had no hair when you were in Swiss, and now you're taking the, the hair supplement. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Geez, it works. It's growing out. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're having some fun. Um, yep. I, you, you rang me yesterday, and um, I picked up quickly. You were talking to your dog in a baby voice. <laughs> <laughs> My wife overheard that. She goes. <laughs> <laughs> did, did that guy pick up the phone when you were calling through? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Go, don't worry. He's a dog owner. He's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, you're relaxed. You've got this new business called Light Warrior. That's right. What's it going to be? So Light Warrior is uh, run by the gentleman who sold the Swiss business um, with Goldman's, and he's come across to, to work with, with me, and we're in partnership and we run this investment and ventures firm. And investment adventures firm. And ventures and firm. And ventures. And ventures, yeah. Um, so the investment part is is essentially investment in safe investments and so forth, and then there's the ventures part, which is investing in, in higher risk-type businesses, mini Swisses, and so we've got seven of those on board so, so far. So are you, are you a venture capitalist? Yeah, so is we do, do a is? bit of that, but we want to make sure that whatever we invest invest in it's around social impact and about making sure that we, we're creating a great culture and, and, and making a better society. Um, so we've got seven of those businesses. Keeps us really busy. What's an example of one? What's, uh, a fa- what's your favourite one? There's no favourite. Oh, you, okay. yeah, yeah, I bet there is. The, 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 the favourite part of it all is the diversity, yeah? So having something new to talk about each time I go into a yeah, right. different business. So right. and Because for so long I've always been in one business and Swiss talking centric. about one set of issues. Yeah. That, that's what I love about the role right. and that's what's really important to me. So um, so that that's called Light Warrior. It's what my uh, wife said to me when she fell in love with me, that I was her Light Warrior. Oh. And we've created a <laughs> – so it's stuck. Uh, and then we've created a foundation called called Light Folk, and the Warriors are out there protecting the Light Folk. And my wife um, runs that foundation, and she's bought a, uh, a wellness and wisdom retreat. And um, and we've also made a, a significant amount of donations to education and, and medicine. And um, and this wellness and wisdom retreat uh, will be really, really quite unique. It'll be not-for-profit, and um, it'll have... Um, Where is it? It's down in Red Hill. And oh, it'll have man, um, my part some, of the world. Yeah, so it'll have some amazing restaurants, some amazing, amazing ed- educational courses, um, connection uh, to to cultures such as uh, indigenous culture, through to ancient um, cultures around. Um, things like meditation through to the different prophets and respecting oh, all of their buddy, viewpoints. Buddy, so it should be a fun f- spiritual journey. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I really look forward to following that. Thank you. Uh, Light Warrior having impact, a social Im- looking for things that have a social impact. I know a really good podcast uh, that's impacting a lot of small business owners around okay. the world looking for support. Okay. Yeah, you're on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Radix Ali, Light Warrior. Thanks for sharing, buddy. Thank you, guys. Love chatting. Cheers. Our what a great story. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go, team. Radak Sali, retired CEO and part owner, now multi gazillionaire of the Swiss multivitamin brand. Uh, I, I Facebook lived that interview, so if you wanted to sort of see that interview, maybe listen to it a second time and watch it, you can head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com three, uh, forward slash 371. Coming up, I share my top three attention grabbers from that fireside chat with Radak. Plus, I'll show you how to increase the dollar amount per sale with one simple email almost every time. But first, it's time to get more done in your business, I think, without spending a fortune. Support for this show comes from Cornerstone, an Aussie-owned, family-run offshoring business based in the Philippines. You know, one of the great fears business owners have about offshoring is whether the people are suitably qualified which may be a little unfounded. I asked Cheska, Cornerstone's marketing manager, to share her background. I was a consistent university um, scholar. I was a president's lister and a consistent college scholar as well. So I graduated magna cum laude. And um, That's where the high five runs. Yeah, I know. You've been waiting for that, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a build-up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I graduated magna cum laude and I ranked second in the whole university. Cornerstone, where the idea of employing someone smarter than yourself is not just encouraged, but welcomed with open arms. Start working smarter now and employ a virtual marketing assistant. Visit cornerstonebusinesssolutions.com.au or give them a call on 02 9083 
6689 and tell them Timbo sent you. Righto, my top five. I know, I know it's normally top three. I couldn't get it down to three. Attention grabbers from my chat with Swiss multivitamins, Radic Sali, thanks to 52ways.biz and Cornerstone. Attention grabber number one. I love the idea that as brand builders, we're part of a Ferrari Formula One crew. At least that's how we should view ourselves. And that whatever we're working on, we should do it at full throttle ready for it all to disintegrate once we get to the finish line. Love that. Attention grabber number two. I love Raddick's quote, the sky is just the beginning. Talk about glass half full. Raddick is one of the more optimistic people I think I have ever met. And I love how he's always looking for a way to make something work. Are you? I'm not. Sometimes I find ways to make it not work. It annoys me. Glass half full. Sky's just the beginning. Attention grabber number three. I love how he visited his retailers when he first stepped into the business all those years ago. You know, if he hadn't done that, he wouldn't have uncovered the celebrity endorsement strategy that Centrum were using so well, and then he beat it. Attention grabber number four. I loved Raddick's modesty. I mean, the guy's responsible for building one of Australia's most successful brands... He's made $255 million in doing so, but his ego, very, very in check. Love it. Attention grabber number five, I loved the three pillars of premium, proven, and aspirational through which all Swiss multivitamin business decisions were evaluated and made. Three brand pillars. Have you got yours? I'd be interested to know. I'd also be interested to know what grabbed your attention. Send me a smoke signal. <laughs> what have you got to lose? Oh, yes, it's time for one simple yet effective marketing idea that you can implement today. It's not going to cost you a fortune. It might just generate you more awareness, more inquiry, and ultimately more sales. And I call today's idea the awesome upsell email. You know, sometimes... All you have to do is ask. That's really what the awesome upsell email is all about. It's you going out of your way to proactively ask your customers if they'd buy again. To send effective upsell emails, you have to convince people that you're just trying to help and avoid coming across as too forceful or annoying. Most importantly, your upsell email needs context. Your customers need to be able to easily recognize why they are getting the email you're sending them and your call to action needs to be crystal clear. So, for example, if you bought my book, The Boomerang Effect, then you might get an email from me asking if you'd like to purchase an hour's marketing coaching. That makes sense. Or if you run a bed and breakfast, you might email people who book with the offer of a spa treatment. Might partner up with the spa down the road. So, Here's my three steps to getting more dough from your emails. Step one, decide what kind of upsell you can make to your customers. Remember, the purpose of the email is to add value and to help in addition to boosting conversions and sales. Step two, create your upsell email using your email marketing client. If you don't have one, then check out Active Campaign, which is what I use, or MailChimp. Step three, Send out your offer and actively track the responses. If it's a no-brainer and simple to purchase, you should get a 50-plus percent conversion. And here's my pro tip. Keep your upsell simple. So avoid lots of options and keep it relevant so that it makes sense for your customer to buy the upsell given what they've just already purchased from you. Hey, and if you want to go nuts, then make it time-sensitive as well. There you go. That's my three steps to creating an awesome upsell email. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 371 where you'll find a link to this post plus some additional resources to bring this idea to life, including a great post on the anatomy of an awesome upsell email. So what have you got to lose? Well, That almost wraps up another episode of the Small Business Big Marketing Show. But don't stress, there is plenty of marketing gold coming your way in the weeks ahead. 
including a chat with a photographer who got tired of taking photos and is now running the business of his dreams. Plus, one of Australia's leading chefs reveals what appearing on MasterChef has done for his personal and business brands. Hey, have you listened to the chat I had a few years ago with Melissa Coker? She owns a small fashion label in downtown LA and at the time was responsible for creating the world's most viral marketing video that was called First Kiss. I think that First Kiss was sort of a prime example of the fact that, you know, it's all about ideas and and getting people engaged in sharing your content. Um, when, When we set out to do this film in particular, I was studying a lot about the success of sites like BuzzFeed and Upworthy and uh, not only, you know, why they were working, but but how they were working. Um, And one thing that really stood out to me was the fact that they would sort of hit on this idea that emotional content is a way to really connect with people out there. And also to get them to to share your content and your ideas. Yeah. So you know this has been an, a phenomenal example of, of that really you know illustrating that point. Oh, was it ever? Got to love that emotional content. If you haven't seen the first kiss video, then check it out. It's amazing. As of today, it's had one hundred and twenty. 52 million views. And if you're keen to understand how and why it was created, then you'll love my chat with Melissa, which you'll find over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, along with hundreds more, or you can subscribe free on your favorite podcast catcher, which I would love you to do. Hey, I'd also love to hear from you. Tim at Tim Reed, reid.com.au, at Timbo Reed on Twitter. Uh, you'll find uh, the Small Business Big Marketing Show on Facebook. And be sure to grab your free seat at Dale Beaumont's 52 Ways events that are touring Australia and New Zealand in June and August. New dates, new seats were la- uh, launched uh, for Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney for late August. Head over to 52ways.biz, grab your free seats. Plus, if, you, if your to-do list is freaking you out, then it's time to start building that team in the Philippines, I'd suggest. Give Cornerstone's David Warner buzz on 029037-8275 or visit cornerstonebusinesssolutions.com.au. If you love the small business big marketing show, why wouldn't you? Then let another business owner know about it. Grab their phone, open the podcast app, look for the show, the small business big marketing show, and subscribe for them. Until next week, I'm Tim Bo Reed. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.